Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Our text for our meditation this morning is taken from our Old Testament lesson from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 33, verses 14 through 16. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the gracious promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord our Righteousness. So far, text. Your Christian friends, Advent is kind of a unique season of the church year. Behind me just screams Christmas and all of the signs and symbols that you're familiar with, and yet the readings did not necessarily, did they? It was like we were back in end times, huh? The world's still ending? You see, traditionally, Advent means coming, of course. Jesus coming as a baby. Jesus coming into our hearts. And finally, Jesus coming on the last day. And it's impossible to miss those, to extract those out of all of the prophecies that we go through, that you'll hear this Wednesday evening when we have our Advent service. The prophets cannot separate them out because... They couldn't tell the difference. All they knew was that their Savior was coming. How and what he was going to look like, they weren't sure. Jesus' first and second coming are blurred to the prophets. And so we're going to go to the prophet Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, the one who watched Jerusalem get pounded and then watched its people pulled away to exile. What did he see? What hope did he have to give them? You see, Advent means anticipation. And through these words from the prophet Jeremiah, you're going to see it's anticipation of a promise fulfilled. Anticipation of work that is finished. And finally, anticipation of righteous realized. Christmas is coming. You've probably heard those, those phrases before. And uh, my dad loved to use those words. I had two brothers, and if we'd want a new toy or a new baseball bat or hockey stick or a video game, we'd say, Dad, wouldn't, wouldn't that be great? Have you seen what this thing can do? It, it would mean we could all use it together? It would be like a family thing almost? And without too much time, he'd think, and he'd go, that's only 127 more days, boys. Christmas is coming. And that was his way of saying, you know, maybe, not right now. But those were easy questions for, for him to answer. How far away is Christmas? When a Jew who was talking to his dad, they're in Babylon and they'd say, yeah, I've heard stories about the Jordan River and how beautiful it is. Springtime, how everything is in just bloom. It's a beautiful part of the world. How long, how long until I get to go back and see that, Mom and Dad? And that'd be really easy for them. They could tell them exactly. Oh, well, we've been here 34 years. We've got to be here 70 years. That's how long God sent us into exile. So 36 years, we're going to be back. God keeps his promises. Those are easy questions to answer for God's people. Listen to the first verse once more time. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the gracious promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Simple, right? Nothing to it. The hard question is when the kids would answer, Man, I can't wait. 36 years seems like such a long time. Why are we in Babylon anyway, Mom? Why did God have to send us into exile, Dad? And then they would have to talk about their sin. 
They'd have to explain their idolatry to their kids. And how they forsook all the promises that God made to them. How He had given them everything. And they threw it away. It's very difficult to explain sin, isn't it? Why did we do that? What were we thinking? I went on a field trip with the 8th grade class this year. And I got to sit next to the middle school dean. And I said, once in a while, I just have to go to my kids and I say, what were you thinking? He said, that's what I do every day. The whole middle school is full of kids who just lose their minds on a random basis and do things that don't make any sense. And I'm going to go a little step further and say all of Christianity is full of Christians who just lose their minds and do things that don't make any sense. Why would we ever rebel against a God who loves us? Why would we ever go against His commands and just ignore them? even though He gives them to us because He loves us. Why? That's an impossible question to answer, isn't it? Sometimes we don't even know why, do we? Why is it that we fall away from God again and again? Well, I said Advent was about promises fulfilled, right? And just like God promised, to bring His people back from exile, so also God promises for us. Not to bring us out of exile necessarily, but He promises not to treat us as our sins deserve. Right? He promises that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You may have to live with a speeding ticket. You may have to live with a broken relationship. And yet the consequences end in this life, don't they? You will not be punished forever in hell for what you have. Because God punished Jesus instead. You've already seen that promise fulfilled. And now, as two of the lessons in our text illustrated, we eagerly await, lift up your heads. Because our redemption is drawing nigh when that promise finally and the last day will be fulfilled when Jesus comes and takes us to heaven. I look forward to that day. Well, <laughs> Advent is also a time of work that is finished. That's anticipation. Some of you um, are list makers. I'm married to one. It's a good thing. She is a blessing in my life. And yet, have you ever heard of people who always want to see things accomplished and, and that there are things that just need to be done that are horrible. I think of uh, sheriff elections and you'd think that Winston-Salem was just in disarray and that they were gangs of wild dogs and, and children with knives. I mean, come on. Is it really that bad, guys? And yet, we need to accomplish something. Well, you'd think something was going on too here with verse 15. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line and he will do what is just and right in the land. All right, now the picture's a little confusing. Uh, when I think of a sheriff, maybe I can relate to that, but I don't, when I think of a, a stump and a sprout or a branch growing from that, what's going on there? So the picture was very clear to the Jews. If you were a Jew, okay, and uh, the stump... From David's line, David was the king, right? He was, that's, that was the be-all and end-all of Israel. They were a world power under David. Well, things weren't that great. Okay, how, how are they doing politically? They don't actually exist, technically, because they're in exile in Babylon. That was 500 years. 500 years. And so they have to wait 500 more years? Really? That line of kings was useless and completely dead. And yet God says, from that line, from David's line, I'm going to produce someone who's going to do what is just and right. How would Jesus do that? What kind of justice would Jesus bring? 
Well, it was a justice and a righteousness apart from the law. You're going to hear that a little bit more in Bible class. During the season of Advent, we're going to go through the characters of Christmas. And I have to start with Jesus. And I'm going to break apart the Christology, how he's God and man, just a little bit very quickly for you. And you're going to see what he can bring and what he can accomplish. And any time you hear about his righteous arm, it's the righteousness that we can't do all by ourselves. I already talked about how you failed. But Jesus succeeded. He was perfect for you. He was the reason why he could go to the cross and be the perfect sacrifice. When, when you're going to hear John the Baptist point and say, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the only reason that was possible was because he was perfect in every way. He was just for you and righteous for you because you couldn't be. Advent is anticipation of work that's finished. And that was ultimately Jesus. And finally, Advent is also an anticipation of righteousness realized. Well, that's kind of a fun little phrase. What does that mean? Look at the last verse. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord our righteousness. Now, God, I just told you that Jesus is going to do this because not of any laws that he would write, but because he would be perfect in your place. And then he gives it to us somehow. Judah and Jerusalem in those days. Those days, what would those, those days look like? Well, I've got to take a step back and tell you a story. Let's imagine, for an instance, that you are a family of seven, a mom and dad and five kids, and you go to a restaurant. And you have a wonderful meal, and at the end you're going to pay, and yet you can't because your credit card and your debit card were both rejected because you just made a major purchase. There's plenty of money in the bank, but it just, it just won't work. And uh, you're standing there with the bill, and you're looking all worried, and there's people around you who are feeling anxious for you. And uh, one guy whips out, you know, his Miles card and just says, here, put on this. He walks away. Now, what do you do? Do you put on the apron and you go back and you wash dishes? Probably not, right? That'd be foolish. It's already paid for. And yet, that's what we do sometimes when we tell our God, I understand that you paid my bill, God. I understand that I am the Lord our righteousness. That's the name that I bear as a Christian. And yet it's not good enough. I need to add on my pathetic works. Otherwise, I'm sure you wouldn't like me. That's the lie that Satan whispers in your ear every holiday season. That if you just decorate your house nicer, then God will like you. If you just buy your kids better gifts, then God would like you. Maybe your life will be more happy if you listen to Christmas music on the radio. The whole reason for this season is so that you understand how you bear that name, the Lord our righteousness, and where God gets off calling you that. To see the beauty and the power in that. Let me tell you what you will do. Instead of putting on the apron and going to the back and washing dishes, you will grab that man's outstretched hand and you will shake it and you will say, thank you for what he's done for you. How can you say thank you in this life? How can you say thank you to what God has done for you? How can you show the world how much gratitude that you have in your heart? You can decorate your house. You can buy your kids a Christmas gift. You can listen to Christmas music. The difference may not seem like much. On the outside, you can't tell, can you? And yet underneath, it is so important that that be clear in your mind going forward or else you're going to be lost. All of that what you, that goes into this season can be an expression and a symbol of the thanks that just oozes from your heart. 
May it be so, my friends. If it is, Advent can be an incredible time of anticipation. An anticipation of promises fulfilled. Of work. Of work that is completed. Fulfilled. And finally, righteousness realized. Dear friends, you are the Lord our righteousness. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.